Hello, it's David. And this is a Pi Storm. Now the Pi Storm has been doing the rounds in the Amiga world for a few years now. And what this basically is, is an interface between uh, the 68000 socket. This is the DIP64 68000 socket. You can see I have the equivalent over here on uh, my STE via this adapter. And this is an interface between that and with this header at the top here, the Raspberry Pi. Now the Raspberry Pi is a small, if you haven't seen this, what have you been doing? But uh, it's a small little single board computer, uh, which uh, the idea is that the, the top level model should always be available for around 35 to $40. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> chip shortage, bit in everyone, and these are effectively unavailable at the moment. But what the, uh, what the Pi Storm does is allows the, uh, the Raspberry Pi to plug into it like that. The whole thing goes into your machine in some mad tower of terror, and it provides an interface where the 68000 is emulated in software on the Raspberry Pi, communicates over GPIO through this header, gets multiplexed by this CPLD and these six flip-flops to drive the pins directly, and you have a purely virtual 68000. Well, what's the point of that? Well, fundamentally, this runs at two and a half gigahertz and has four cores, and uh, the 68000 of the ST runs at eight megahertz and has a single core and is 50 years old. This should be faster. Also, it opens up the possibility of using some of the other um, functionality on here. We can perhaps use some of the RAM as alt RAM uh, on the, uh, the ST. We can maybe upgrade the processor by writing new routines. We can perhaps use the HDMI app, maybe the Wi-Fi, the network. So this, I believe, is a really good way of future-proofing our machines. However, it doesn't work on the ST. So my task today is to start looking into this, connect this all up, and see if we can get PyStorm working on the ST. So this is what it looks like when it's all put together, and uh, there you can see why I've got the extra height there for the clearance. This is actually designed to run with a uh, Raspberry Pi uh, 3A, uh, whereas I've got a 3B, and uh, yeah, so it's got all these big chunky uh, USB sockets, and I don't want to desold all those, so I've just used these uh, extended pin headers. And this works fine, and when I connect it up and I put it in to my uh, adapter here, my uh, DIP64 adapter, um, I can see it kind of works. Um, I can read the ROM from the machine, which is, which is good, but um, RAM doesn't work. I think it's a timing issue and I need to investigate it. And the problem is that in this configuration, there's not a lot of scope for me getting any debugging information out. What I really need to do, apart from in the software, obviously, but hardware debugging, what I really need to do is to sniff these pins and to find out why I can't read the, uh, the memory properly. And there just isn't the scope for me uh, getting my logic analyzer in here. So I think what I'm going to do is to design a little interface board that's going to fit between uh, the um, 68000 socket on my adapter here and the pins on the Pi Storm itself. Uh, perhaps I'll move the Pi Storm over one way a little bit and provide some debugging headers uh, over on the other side so that I can plug my um, logic analyzer into it uh, and see on my Mac what is actually going on in, uh, in real time. And so this is what I've come up with. This is the 68000 plug. This is the 68000 socket. And there's a one-to-one -one connection between all of the pins, or the address pins, data pins, uh, bus pins. So A1 goes to A1, A14 to A14, all the way down. And the same on the other side. So clock is 15 goes to clock 15. This is just a mirror image to make it easier to set this up. 
But then also, every single one of these pins is tapped off to these two connectors over here. So these will be simple uh, 2x32 and 2x2 um, 2.54 millimeter headers. And the idea is that this layout here will correspond to the normal uh, pin layout on a 68000. So pin 1 is D4. And uh, actually it will go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but it, the pin number here is irrelevant. The, the position is the same. So it will run down this side, run back up this side. So D5 finishing opposite D4. Uh, except I haven't connected the power and ground just to avoid accidentally uh, shorting when I'm uh, manipulating the logic uh, analyzer. So the power and the ground go to their own little separate headers here. This is the layout that I've gone for. So we've, uh, we've got a simple rectangle. We've got the plug as the rightmost U1, uh, the rightmost um, layout here, 68,000 uh, DIP64 layout. And the socket is offset to its left, but only by about half the width of the uh, half the width of the chip itself. So they'll be slightly staggered. And then over here we have our uh, tap off headers, and all of the names are printed on the silk screen above it. There's our five volts and ground tapping point, and uh, I've just put a big old silk screen on there so that we know what it is. The, uh, the traces I've used, these are all uh, 0.25mm, so 9.84mm, well within the capabilities uh, of the manufacturing house, uh, with the exception of the, um, the power line, which is uh, the 5 volt line this is, which is half a millimetre track, and uh, these uh, connect both uh, to each other and also around the top here to the um, around the top to the 5 volt connector here the entire back of the board is a ground plane if i turn on the planes there we go you can see the entire back of the board is ground plane so this should have sufficient current carrying ability to supply power to our chip which in this case is a Pi Storm, which does require a lot more power, uh, but also uh, provide a decent signal integ integrity. You see there's no uh, signals going through wires uh, for our logic analyzer. This is a quick preview of what I expect it to look like when it comes back from the board house. And speaking of board houses, this is an excellent time for me to introduce my channel sponsor, PCB way, because I think we know who's going to be manufacturing this. Now PCBWay.com can provide you excellent quality boards with a very fast turnaround, but that's not the only thing that they do. They also offer CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing, and even injection molding. So if you're looking to get your circuit boards manufactured, like me today, or any other project off the ground, they may be able to help you out. Why not have a look at their website? You'll find it linked in the description down below. So let's get this board manufactured. First, in KiCad, we need to generate our Gerbers. We go to Plot, choose our Output Directory, and choose the layers that we're interested in. Now this board is a two layer board, so I'm going for the front, the back, the front and back silk screen, the front and back solder mask, and the edge cuts. I press plot, and the Gerbers have been generated into the directory that I specified. I still need to generate drill files, so I simply click on that, and the output folder is preset. That's been added into the directory. Now, within that directory, I shall rename the Gerber's directory to 68k debug and zip it. Now it's time to visit pcbway.com and click on instant quote. 
I click on Quick Order PCB, add Gerber file, and I choose the 68K debug zip that I just created. As you can see, it's detected a two layer board of approximately 70 by 85 millimeters. And immediately it's given me an estimated price over here on the right hand side. PCB Way offer a comprehensive selection of options suitable for most prototyping needs. In my case, it's a fairly simple requirement. Five pieces, two layers, standard FR4, 1.6 millimeters is the normal thickness for PCBs. And I'm not going below six by six mil in terms of track width or spacing. In fact, I could actually choose eight by eight, although that doesn't make any difference in our case. The minimum hole size does not exceed 0.3. And I think I'm going to have a blue solder mask today. My silk screen is perfectly okay white. There's no edge connector and I'm happy with the standard leaded finish. I don't like tented wires, so I'm going to choose not covered. I'm happy with the standard finish and I'm not at all worried about there being some markings on my board. This is an entirely through-hole component, so I'm not going to select any of the SMD or assembly options, but it's nice to know that they're available. I move on to calculate, choose my shipping country, and I'm presented with a variety of postal options to suit any budget. I think I will go with the PCB way Express. I save that to cart and I can move on to payment. So it's been a few days and here it is. Let's see what we've got. Nicely packaged and here we go. 68k debug. Five boards in blue. Let's uh, let's open one up and have a quick look. So there she is. So the idea with this is we've got two 68,000 ports passed through, one directly connected to the other, but each uh, line is tapped off to a header here, which we can uh, which we can sniff with our uh, logic analyzer. Nothing on the back. And we've got a five volt on ground as well. I haven't connected those here, just avoids us shorting something out by mistake. So I think we're back to the big jar of headers. And I'm off to solder it up. So there we go, all uh, assembled up and uh, just giving it a bit of a scrub. Still needs a little bit of a dry. Now the idea is, of course, that, uh, well, here's our there's going to be a huge tower here. Here's our SCE adapter. And this is going to plug into that. So pin one at the top here. Now we find out how good my alignment, my soldering alignment's been. There we go. So that's going to go into the STE, exposing all of our debug headers. Then our Pi Storm with the uh, extended top to allow the, uh, the Raspberry Pi 3 uh, B to go on there. So uh, here's pin one at the top here. So that's going to now clip into this side. Uh, again, we check our alignments. Look reasonable. Oh. Proving tough to go in.
Oh, gosh, there. That was uh, that's very tough, actually. Uh, anyway, right, that's in. Then our Raspberry Pi 3, uh, 3B in this case, hence the, uh, as I say, hence the extension. So that's going to go this way around. So that slots in there. There we go. <laughs> what a beast. So that's then going to plug into the PLCC uh, socket on the STE, and it will expose these pins over here for me to plug in my uh, cheap and nasty logic analyzer. So we can hopefully see what's going on and work on our virtual processor. And so here it is, all in situ. The, uh, the new debug board is in and connected up to my logic analyzer. You can see it's, uh, it's recording away there. Uh, that's the clock, AS, DTAC and uh, bus error. And unfortunately bus error is, uh, is all we're seeing at the moment. So AS goes low. Nothing happens for a whole bunch of clock cycles and bus error. So I've got something to investigate now. We've got some uh, funky output on the screen of the STE, but I do have now at least the necessary tools at my disposal to try and figure out what's going on here. But that's probably for another video. Thanks for watching. Okay, that was mean. I'm not gonna leave you on a cliffhanger. Here's a quick uh, high-speed uh, run-through of a GenBench 6 test uh, of work uh, to date after about um, a week's effort has gone into this. Now you'll see the figures on the whole are incredibly encouraging, which is why I think this has uh, a future. Apart from, unfortunately, a crucial one, the ST RAM figure shown as RAM access on here. This is currently very slow, it's about half speed. Until we can rectify this and get this working close to or at 100%, um, this is not going to be a viable, a viable replacement processor because um, nothing that uses ST-RAM will feel remotely faster, basically all games. Now you see in this demo that uh, we're booting uh, a custom version of Emutos from the Raspberry Pi, emulating the ROM, uh, it's also emulating 8 megabytes of Alt-RAM, uh, which uh, is, again, an advantage of uh, using the, uh, the virtual CPU in this case. Um, there is an issue at the moment that the, uh, uh, the CPU emulator software running on here does not properly implement bus error. Um, and so what I've done to get this to work at all is to make a custom version of Emutos where everything is pre-configured and the operating system does no attempts to detect the hardware here in the STE. So this is, this is only working in a very limited uh, manner, and in fact, about half the time, uh, you'll get a spurious crash um, for no reason. So this is very, very early days. Um, it's just to show that there is hopefully potential here. We are not anywhere close yet to a viable product for the STE series. Thank you very much for watching. You can always download the, uh, the full KiCad files for uh, my 68K debug at my GitHub page, and I'll see you in the next video.